Race, conversations, and law enforcement. This is Moses' People Speak. Hello everyone, this is Terry Watson, the founder of the Battle with Moses People. Uh, I'm very excited today to have our guest, Deshonda T. Carter. Uh, she is a, the CEO of Simply Carter, um, and I am going to let her introduce herself. Um, so without ado, yes. thank you for joining me today. Now everyone can actually see you. <laughs> everyone, now they can. So whatever you say, whatever you do is being recorded. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, <laughs> so first thing, you know, uh, I, I definitely appreciate your time. You know, I, I reached out to you because I was absolutely fascinated about the book you just published. Can you give me some insight to, you know, what that book's about and, and sort of what led you to write that book? Yes. And I, and actually, I, and can you too, uh, also, also, can you let people know how much it costs? Because I, I actually am about to place order myself. So I know the answer to that, but there, how much is the book? Oh, great. Oh, no. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, how about now? How about now? Can you hear me? Oh gosh, that's no good. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, so, all right, let's see here now. Give me awesome. So, tell us about your book. Well, I missed everything, the good stuff that you said in the beginning. So, <laughs> you wanted to know. Um, about the book. That was a question, right? Correct. So correct. my book is called Correction Captain to Correct Entrepreneur. Did we hear that part? And I kind of just put it up there. Thank and you. you guys can purchase that on my website, Simply Carter Corp. www.simplycartercorp.com. And yep. you wanted to know why did I write this book? Yes. I would uh call myself a serial, serial entrepreneur. I have several businesses, I would say right now, approximately four. Okay. And what happened in, what happened was I was, get, was getting a lot of questions from mostly a lot of younger people and some of the older people who were getting ready to retire and just didn't know what to do. Everyone that comes from law enforcement tends to go into security. So they retire, they wear a uniform for how many, 20, 25 years, and then they go back into some form of security, wearing a uniform. Some may not wear a uniform, but it's still the same mindset. Right. Um, I wanted to do something totally different. I've always, even prior to my own businesses, I was a uh, sales director for Mary Kay. I don't know if you're familiar with Mary Kay. Um, I, I am. You are, yes. Yeah. So I had a car and everything. Thing. I had a team. I was really big in it. I loved, I loved what Mary Kay stood for. And I'm going to tell you that one of my inspirations and role models in Mary Kay, who is Gloria Mayfield Banks, I looked at her in such a way that she fascinated me as a woman, period, in business. Gotcha. And um, Mary Kay itself, the principles of the company is what I kind of adapted. It, it was a woman-based business and it was like a sisterhood. So I kind of took that part away and walked away with that when I left. Um, and I didn't really leave Mary Kay because it'll always be with me because I really love the camaraderie of being with women. Right. So um, I just, I'm just not as active as I used to be. Okay. So, uh, because I have so many different ventures that I want to do on my own. And, and mainly one of those ventures is leaving a legacy for my children. Right, right. And let, let me ask you too, because you mentioned this, that you are not just uh, looking at the entrepreneurship, but also uh, how to get other 
females to enter the business field. I know I looked at your website and one of the things you're trying to, trying to do is encourage uh, females to go into the business sector. Uh, and because of that, you actually, uh, I see do some consulting. Can you tell me a little bit more about your consulting? Yes. So it spawns from the book and the book was actually, it touches on the very beginner's guide. So like a woman may be saying to herself, you know what I want to do. There's a lot of businesses out here that direct marketing, you know, um, that they can go into a structured already formed business. Right. Right. Um, but this, this book kind of tells you on the things like if you want to do that, but it's also, if you want to start your own, I know many women who, uh, knit, crochet, do hair, do nails, so mm -hmm. many wonderful things that they could be making money. Now I'm not talking about regular money. Like, okay, I'm going to do hair out my house and get a couple of dollars. And That's nothing is New York. wrong with that. <laughs> That's for every New York, by the way. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yes, I'm from New York. That's what we yeah. do. We utilize our houses and yeah. make money, make me sit in and all that stuff. Yeah. But it's, they just don't realize how much more and cost effective for them if they legalized and made it a business. Right. Because now, if I braid hair, I'm, I'm sitting there braiding hair all day, but what about if I take my skills made it a business and then trained some young girls to braid hair. Now right. they walk away with a skill, right? right. And they yeah. can go out and branch off and do their own thing. So I don't believe in keeping knowledge for self. Right. That's what the book is for. Oh. Because I've spent thousands on thousands. I mean, I probably could have been a millionaire as much money as I've kicked out over the years <laughs> trying to learn something or get information for someone. I mean, not to say some of the, some money I've spent has been well spent and some money I've spent has been just like, really, I paid this <laughs> to get that. But I wanted to share what I've gained for a $50 book. It's basic. You know, right. and if you want to, and inside the book is journaling pages too, because it will help you, you know, how you're reading on the train or you're reading in the, under the dryer and yeah. you have a thought that comes to your head right. and you may not have paper. So, you know what, after you read that chapter, you take your notes and it nice. helps you keep everything structured and together. So now you don't even know or realize you just started to formulate your business plan and your yeah. ideas. So that's, for that's me, brilliant. It's all, yeah, well, it's, it's because a lot of times women don't realize how wonderful they are and how they can just take their ideas and really put it into fruition. Like, come on, oh, guys. Yeah. That's not, no, it just, it's just a matter of, I'm sorry. No, no, I, I was going to say that at least another question too is, um, you know, you, you talk a lot about, empowering the community to be more business money and 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 how you are just not holding that knowledge to yourself but you sort of spreading that love you know why is that important to the right. community why do you think that's so important to the community well one thing for for certain i i'm not sure exactly where and who who i heard this from but i know it wasn't my idea and i know i didn't come up with it but the the thought is why should our children have to go outside of our community to beg somebody else for a job mm. in our communities? I remember when we had the shoe man outside, you know what I'm saying? When the, they had the mechanics that used to do work outside, literally on the street. Right. There's nobody, this generation, they, they, they're not learning hands-on. Everything is just so computerized. Everything is just, the quick, fast, here and now. These computers all go zonk at one time. They have no skill set. You can't, you, they can't Google how to fix a flat tire if yeah. we have a power surge and there's no power and Siri can't give them no instruction. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think it's very important. Yeah. No, really. Yeah. Because I'm one of those people, like, I'll ask for something and they'll be like, oh, did you Google it? And my <laughs> mind doesn't rip automatically go to Google all the time. Go to Google, go to Siri, go to Google, go to Siri. Right. And that's what everybody does. Right. But, and there's nothing wrong with that because technology is here, but we still have to know how to function without it. Right? Right, right. 
So with especially, that being said, yeah, especially when, when it, it says, especially when it fails, because when it's, technology fails, you're typically left in the dark, literally. Right, because yeah. nobody is picking up books. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> so let's just say I wrote a book to have tangible. I'm a tangible person. Like I'm one of those people. I need to sit down. I can't just always go to the computer. I need to see stuff in my hand, right? Right. But you you say, oh, I read all the time, but you're reading on ebook. So again, if if something goes down, even in schools, I, I didn't even realize this. I, I I you know I have the car service as one of my businesses as well. And the young the young man was telling me he's in the first grade and he's like, oh we do computers, you know, everything is computer. And I said everything is computer. I said you don't use the notebook? He was like, no. And I was talking to another young man who's in high school who works on my glam truck. And he was like, yeah, he says school is great. They give them a laptop or some type of computer in the beginning of the year. They take it home for the summer. And at the end of the year, when they graduate, it's theirs. Everything yep. is, you know, just straight computer, you know? So, <laughs> yep, but, yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I know. That's the world today. I'm not, that's the absolute truth. <laughs> so, okay, you know, one of the things I, 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 I want to also ask, because you have a background in law enforcement. I see that awesome picture behind you, um, and <laughs> and uh, you know, funny. So so you this the, the title of the book is from correctional captain to correct an entrepreneur. Correct. Uh, so yes. were there some skills that was transferable from being in law enforcement to being a entrepreneur? Well, I would just say one of the things I retired as a supervisor in correction. So the supervisory skills, I, I would definitely say, and even as an officer, you're still pretty much a supervisor because you see mates all day. So just being in a, a position from day one of having to give instruction and being a person in charge definitely hones over to your entrepreneur spirit. So that was, I would say that is the biggest thing that I definitely get. And a lot of the work that you do as a correction officer, a lot of times is independent. You're, if you're an officer, sometimes you're in a housing area by yourself with 56 inmates and you have to be in control of that whole entire housing area. Um, sometimes you're a supervisor and you're in charge of maybe four housing areas that have 56 inmates and six officers and you're the one supervisor and you're responsible for all of them. You know, oh, so right. you definitely get that notion of how decision making, you know, spot like quick decision making where you don't have time to hem and haw and, and debate, go back and forth. You you have to be able to be a quick thinker. Right. So I would say that's the best. I would say that's what I got as far as honing over any particular skill and also dealing with people um, as far as customer service. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of say that that is kind of related because you have to be able to have interpart well, in, they call it interdepartmental skills, yeah. be able to talk the young man or young woman off the ledge. So you have to have a lot of patience. And I would say that you, you get that in um, corrections as well, because sometimes these uh, detainees can Try your patience. <laughs> now, I, I had a, I was, now check this out. I, I, I just got back from a training. So I, I decided along with a friend of mine to volunteer in the prison system. Uh, I, 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 we was, there's a, there's a thing here in Center County, Pennsylvania, in which um, in order for an inmate to see their children, they have to have a volunteer and they have to go to a training, like a parent training. So I just signed up to volunteer for that. As part of that, I, I had to be trained on dealing with the inmates. And so uh, the person that was training us sort of gave us a little snippets of uh, the ratio between, you know, uh, 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 an officer and being on the floor. So that one to 56. And as I understand it, you guys don't actually have any, like, I don't want to say weapons or any kind of protection. You're just there as a uh, sort of to supervise that that area. Is that well, right? we do have we have chemical agent, which you can say is pepper spray or OC. Okay. Um, but again, 
you only allow three births of that wow. by law, by our standards. So that means if the three births do not take effect, then um, you're stuck to your own uh, wow. two hands. <laughs> so, you're using, so you're using a lot of people's skills, I guess, <laughs> in, that, in that sense, you know? Well, um, I've been lucky. I, I really, I would really say I've been lucky. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so here's the thing too. I, I mentioned before that part of this is talking about parenting, uh, uh, black children in today's society. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about that recently. Uh, recently I just had, I had a conversation with my son, um, about the situation that happened in our, in our neighborhood. Um, and I know that you also had some interactions, uh, not just with your kids, but also with law enforcement and regarding your kids. So in your, in your sort of right. sense, what, what's some of those stories that stand out to you? Well, I just want to go back and just kind of just give you a little background. Another reason why I can say in my career, I think I could have been kind of empathetic with in inmates as well as being a fair supervisor, a fair officer. My father did 32 years in a federal correction facility. My mother was a law enforcement. My mother was a correction officer. So I, I always joke with people. I said, I could have gone either way. I could have went the way with my father went. I could have went my mother went, right? right? So right. I, I ended up going down the path of following in my mother's footsteps who was also a New York City Department of Correction officer. Um, but I'm going to say the world itself does not seem respect corrections. Um, mm -hmm. And I say that to lead into the segue about me and the interactions with the law enforcement. I live in Middletown, New York, which is in Orange County. This is a county in Orange, New York, County, New York. Yeah. And, I, and I have two situations uh, and they happen to both of my sons. So I have two sons. One is 19 and one is 24. Gotcha. The 19 year old, this happened maybe two years ago. Um, he was out with some friends, a young lady and the young lady at the time, I guess, you know, this back forth boyfriend, girlfriend thing, whatever. She was off. She was on an off period with the yeah. ex-boyfriend. Okay. So she was out with my son, right? And there was a, um, I don't know what these phones do, where it can locate the other person. So the ex-boyfriend located her wow. when she was out with my son. So, you know, they were doing what teenagers do in the back of the car, car door not being locked. The young, the young man uh, came up with two of his other friends and the young man opened the door and started fighting my son in the back seat of the car. Wow. So my son jumps in the front seat. He tries to peel away, which inadvertently caused uh, him to hit a light pole, which fell on the car, right? Listen to this. Wow. It fell on the car door, crushing the boy in Ooh. between the door and the car. Wow. So now, my so let me tell you how good my son is. The boy is in the back crying, screaming, right? After uh -huh. he just just got in the car, started to fight this kid, right? Mm -hmm. My son drives him to the emergency room. Wow. In the midst of my son driving him to the emergency room, my son calls his older brother because the other boys that were involved were still in the car following him. So my son and uh, his friends, they call me. I call the police and tell the police, listen, I'm headed over to the hospital to meet my son because at this point, I really don't know what happened right. in detail. I just know that my son said he's driving somebody to the hospital. I didn't get the details until after the fact. The long and the short of the story was after I called the police, um, which was which was the wall kill police at that time, I believe, they responded and they treated my son like he was the person that did something to the young man. I wow. said, I called you because this young man and these boys tried to attack my son. Wow. And the man was so nasty. He got into my face. And so my now my young I said, what you gonna do, shoot him? And I, you know, and I'm gonna be honest. I had to tell the man, I said, listen, first of all, I outrank you. I really don't wanna speak to you at this point. I need a supervisor on site. 
mm-hmm. because you're not going to talk to me and demean me in front of my son. So this was the dead of winter, December 21st. So when the accident took place, the car windows had gotten smashed out. My son didn't have a coat on. So okay. he wanted to sit in the car. I said, go sit in the car because it was cold. He didn't have on a coat. The right. man wouldn't let him sit in the car. The officer wouldn't let him sit in the car. I said, well, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to drive off in my car while I'm standing here? I said, I don't know what kind of children you have, <laughs> but I'm here with my son and he's not going to go anywhere. Right. It was just, you know, the lack of respect. And, and, it, and it kind of makes you as a mother conflicted. Because right. before anything else, before I don a uniform, my children are top priority top priority and you're not going to make me feel inferior to anyone right anyone okay so long story short that was one incident i ended up writing the officer up and you know it it, it got a little bit of notoriety i I mean i when i tell you i wrote everybody i wrote everybody (laughs) because i needed them to understand that the demographic in this county has changed i you know it's a predominantly you know caucasian area um, mm-hmm. But they have to know this. It's a mixed area now. It's not what you're used to. You know right. what I'm saying? And right. then with the whole presidency, I feel the way that, you know, racism has just big be- people don't put shade on it no more. They say what they want to say. They do what they want to do. And then right. they don't expect any repercussions behind it. Yeah. With my children, there's going to be a repercussion. <laughs> there's going to be a repercussion. And it's not Better so believe it. Because, <laughs> yeah, there is because you're not gonna you're not gonna mistreat them in my right. presence. You that's, understand? That's not gonna oh, yeah. happen. So wow. that happened. Now the incident that you're talking about that happened with my oldest son, um, it didn't happen in the it still was in Orange County, but it was a different town over. And I don't want to misquote the town, okay. but it was still right outside of Middletown where he worked. And uh, my son was in a car accident again. Mm-hmm. And I can hear him. I kept him on the um, phone to, right. you know, because I didn't. Luckily, I got an iPhone. I'm I'm Team Droid, by the way, but I have an <laughs> iPhone too. <laughs> and he was able to send me the location. Okay. And I, I'm like, you know, stay on the phone because I wanted to make sure I get there. And right. I can hear the one police officer, very nice officer, making sure he was okay. Um, they, there was another gentleman, a, a pedestrian that was there that came out of his house once the accident took place. Um, oh. I, you know, everything was fine. I just wanted to get there and make sure my son was good. Right. Upon, there was another officer who came on the scene, and I cannot recall his name. He was a state trooper. He came on the scene, and I can hear him talking to my son and mm. telling my son, while my son is still in the seat in the car, with the back of the car just command, just mush, pushed in. If that car was the other way around, if he would have hit the wow. tree head on, he would have been dead. So wow. he's already in a men- his mental state is not correct. I don't care if you don't see anything physically wrong with him, which he did have some bruising on his face and inside of his mouth. Right. But even if you didn't see any blood, you don't know how a person's mental state is that just right. had a near death experience. Right. And for him to come on the scene after the other respondent officer was there and be judgmental to him and say something to the effect like, oh, well, you shouldn't have been speeding. Everybody else, I made it down a hill and nothing happened to me. Who are you wow. to tell him whether or not he was speeding? It was very bad weather. It was one of those days it kind of just snowed and it was slushy. Right. And he, you know, he came down the hill and he just skidded, you know? And I mean, I, I you know, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, Terry. <laughs> I can definitely say some things out of my mouth, right? So I had to say to him, basically, listen, you law enforcement, that is not how you, you know, respond to someone. Right. And I said to him, you know, I'm law enforcement. He, Immediately, like, well, what law enforcement, what, what division? And I said, correction. He said, oh, please, that doesn't count. That doesn't count. You couldn't do one day in my job. You couldn't do one day because you walk around with a gun on your hip. I'm in a house. Let me t- tell you, Terry, I started corrections. I was 23 years old and 110 pounds. 23 and 110 pounds in housing oh. areas, right? Wow. I worked community segregation. I worked in housing areas with rapists, murderers, the most mm. 
gang affiliate, high ranking, okay? And he's gonna <laughs> with nothing but some with us some spray. And he's gonna <laughs> tell me corrections doesn't count. Wow. I, I was so appalled with him. So you know, I I generated my documentations. I'm waiting for those responses now. Mm-hmm. But they don't see us. What he saw when he saw me, because after that, he got his behind in his car and drove off. Mm-hmm. They don't see us in in a position of uh, authority. They think oh. we're just highly paid babysitters, but look who we're babysitting, if you right. want to call it that. Right. Everybody that you lock up, that you can only be around in the midst of what? Three hours, maybe, but by the time you do the arrest, the paperwork yep. and and send them off to county or send them off to Rikers. You don't spend that time with them, and half the time they are right. they're ma- they're um in handcuffs. Right. We're talking about fifty six men in a housing area with ma- corrections. New York City Department of Corrections is predominantly women based. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. Wow. They walk around. And we're talking about we're not talking about no ugly women either. All right. <laughs> Oh, oh no, 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 no. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. This is about to have right here. Dope, 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 dope. Wow. And we're going to bring her back. Well, that was interesting. Can you see me? I'm back. I'm sorry. I don't know. There was some some countdown and it must not have been, I don't know. Uh, Give me, give me, give me one. Let me bring you back in. Uh, This is (laughs) talking about technology, huh? Uh, exactly. yeah, this is, this is the problem that we typically have. Um, all right, let's see here. I'm going to, okay. Yep. Yeah. We're back in business. Oh, and it was funny. Now it's like a lot better reception too, for some reason. So really? I, don't know, I don't know what happened there, but it's, it's almost perfect. So going back to the, uh, now you you just mentioned before we got disconnected that women majority mm-hmm. in correction. Yes, that is very interesting. I, I gotta be honest. That is that is very interesting. Uh, why 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 is that? Because <laughs> that's a very I don't know. <laughs> you know <laughs> that's a that's a dangerous. I don't why it is. I know when I came into on the job back in nineteen ninety eight there wasn't a requirement for um, college credits. At some point, and I, I really don't know what it is now, to be honest with you. And mm-hmm. just so you know, Terry, I can't see you. Just so you know. Of course not. And now you should be able to. <laughs> yes, I can see you. So um, when I came on the job back in 1998, we didn't. they didn't require that you had college cre- credits. I, again, don't want to miss is now but now is a requirement so i i think that maybe that may be one factor as far as the women um out um outranking the men and coming on to the in onto the job um but our our department is really run by women our chief is a female our commissioner is a female majority of the wardens at this time are female um yeah, I mean, wow. it it it, it is a predominantly female ran for, uh, department in, in New York City, anyway. Well, in New York City. When I did the, when I did the training, uh, just now, it was two females that was See? training us, and you know, it was funny because I'm I'm a pretty big guy, <laughs> and uh, they was like, you know, you're a big dude, but uh, that's that's that that counts against you when you're fighting me, and I was like, whoa. 
I don't know what peace would do. I'm not trying to, <laughs> I ain't, I'm not going that route. But it, right. it was two females that was doing the training and I didn't, that didn't, you know, that didn't even register. That's, 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 that's interesting. That really is interesting. But you know, it also plays, a, it plays a good part in it, in a sense. And this is my takeaway from it. I can't speak on anybody else's, but how I feel. The male population, I feel, a lot of them are looking for their mothers, their sisters, their daughters, their girlfriends. We are basically like social workers at some point, wow. you know, because a lot of times these men just need somebody to listen to. Right. Them, listen to them. And, um, you know, you have your disrespectful individuals, and that's just them as a, in a, just period. You know, they're disrespectful to their own family, so you know they're not going to come and be a decent individual there. But you do have some inmates that are pretty decent in terms of when you tell them and give them instruction and give them direction, they do comply. Right. Most. But then you have the ones that are just problematic. Need and I'm going to tell you, my department, I mean, they are very, very well trained to right. handle these type of situations. And, you know, even though they don't get the accolades that they should, the training staff, the officers, I will always respect and applaud them because they do a very, very good job with the limited amount of equipment that we have to do what we need to do. Because sometimes we don't get a chance to get a response team. The, the officers have to respond and take care of the situations to start out just them. One officer, two inmates, one officer, three inmates, you know, until they can get help in the area. Right. Uh, and let me ask too, because um, it sounds like in that role, conflict resolution is probably the thing that is utilized most. Is that correct? We definitely try. And when I say we, although I am retired, I don't know if we kind of put that out there. I've been retired yeah. now a year. Congrats. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But um, from when I was there, I'm going to just, when I say we, and that's reflective Tory toward the time that I was there, we right. definitely, that was the direction the department definitely wanted to go in, in terms of, you know, we don't, we, people have this misconception that uniform staff just wants to go in there and beat everybody up. Mm -hmm. That's not the case at all. We do the most talking I mean, I ain't never seen so. Let me tell you, inmate told me one time I was in the wrong line of business. He said I should have been a um, politician. He said because I just talk so much, talk him off the ledge. They call me the inmate whisperer. Like I would just be like, okay, we're not gonna do that, you know. And, you know that's. So. I, I think that's really that's very telling too, and. Um, so here's the question I ask everyone that comes on this show, especially uh, with law enforcement background like yourself and the, the years that you've been uh, serving your community. Uh, what do you hope to see from future brothers and sisters entering law enforcement? Well, I think when it comes to African-Americans in, in blue, one thing we still must must be mindful are of we are african american right right i don't have to prove to any other ethnic group anything if i uh -huh. see a person of color in a situation where they have to be apprehended if they, you know they've done something that they should not have done yes they deserve to be handled you know accordingly but they need to be handled the same way you will handle anybody else Right. So what I find, you know, uh, officers of color, they have to prove to their counterparts, oh, they don't care about their, their sister or their brother. Mm -hmm. The same way a Hispanic officer, they talk Spanish to the Hispanic inmate while you are, you know, you don't know what they're talking about, but they're not right. roughing them up. The right. Asian officer is not roughing up the Asian um, perpetrator at that time. We mm -hmm. need to know how to listen. Okay. Right. Let me deal with him. That's because deep. we don't because we always have to feel like we're showing the other races that we don't care about our own race. Wow. That's real deep. And, and, and you know what's interesting? I I got to say I I've I've just came across a story and I, I reached out to this this lady as well. She was uh, a police officer 
on the force for about I, I think a little bit over 20 years as well and uh, they were making an arrest of an African American male that she didn't know okay so it was mm -hmm. anyone else so, uh, and, 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 and as they were uh, transporting this this um, this 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 this, this man to the patrol car, her partner puts him in a chokehold. Now, give it that this man is handcuffed still. Uh, mm -hmm. So she steps in because she's like, no, not on my watch. And she's right. like, she pulls his arm away and he turns around and punches her in the face. Wow. Now, it gets worse though. Now, you get back to the station and he accused her of interfering with and the arrest. The, the arrest, and she gets fired. So, you know, uh, it's it's deep that you say that because, you know, I, I think that's a really important point. And I, I'm hearing that quite a lot is that being able to, and when, I, when I've done training with police, I always get that question, how do we recruit and retain, you know, officers of color? And I, my response is let them be black, right? And what I mean by that is let them be who they are in the in right. blue right um so that's really powerful what you're saying you know and, and i you know i i think that's a really important point you know um so my because it goes back to segregation like at least police, police if you're gonna partner up you know if you're gonna have a black and a white or hispanic when, when you go to a response you know people say oh it's not about race but the reality it is it is it's about race. White people don't necessarily not say all. At all. But if you come from the suburb I live and you work in New York City and you interact or have interacted with people who live in the projects, your mission is that everybody from the projects is in some form of a, a criminal. So when you go to apprehend them, you apprehend them as such. Because person could victim, them, but because you're responding to the projects, what the, the police was shooting him for no reason. He was scared, scared because he's never been out of his community to interact with Black on that level where he felt comfortable to go in there and talk to him. He started wow. shooting at him. Wow. You know, and, and I don't want to say I'm a racist or anything like that, but I Definitely, Emma should believe that people need police, any other demographic don't know deal with us, right. they don't know how to deal with us. Right. right, and I'm tired of seeing so many of my people shot, end up missing, end up dead, and it's okay, right? It's just okay, and I can tell you firsthand in, in corrections, there has been times when I've heard. Uh, higher ranking supervisors who have been of another national, um, yeah, nationality, mm -hmm. would say these are animals, mm -hmm. these animals, referring to the inmates, right? right? And in my mind, that would that bothered me because what do you mean they're animals? Because where we work, they're detainees. They're still waiting for, for the time to be heard before the judge. Right. So. There may be a handful population who is actually innocent, and then you have those reoccurring ones. But it's still not your place to call them animals. And when you're calling a person of color an animal, and you're speaking about me too. Right. You're talking right. about my sons. Yeah. That's what you think of me when you look, because if you're looking at them as black and you see me as black, that's all you see. You don't see me as a black supervisor or a black law enforcement because you wouldn't be comfortable to say that out of your wow. mouth in front of me because I don't wow. think that all of these men and all of these people are animals right and and you know that 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 really that's a really again that's a very powerful message you know I I I was uh just talking to my friend as we did the training together and uh one of the things I noticed was that kind of terminology you know uh, animals, or they like children, and what have you not, and I, and that really does say a lot to the culture, you know. Um, right. You know, right. wow. Because you will hear the adolescent say that you think I'm an animal anyway, so you say that enough to an adolescent, whether they're in jail or not, 
that's going to be their action. That's going to be their mind frame. You're not encouraging them. Listen, you need to get yourself together. This is not, this is not in the form of what I'm saying from the officer's perspective. But if you have people just in general, not encouraging, right? Right. Just always downing. I don't care where they are. You got to meet people where they are. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Because sometimes they just didn't have someone. Sometimes they just don't have anyone. And yeah. it, it'll take something like just an encouraging word from you that day. Hey, right? Because right. they're people. They get, off right. the, they get off the phone. They get bad news. They get depressed. Not to say that they have not committed a crime. I don't know what their crimes are. That's what the judge and jury is there for. Right. But that doesn't make them in make them inhumane or should make should make me inhumane in doing my job. Not sympathetic, but empathetic to life. Period. Right. That's very very important point. Um, all right. One more question, and I promise you, you have you know. Thank you for taking the time. Um, and I I, I want to go back to your book for a second because okay. um, I I I I know that there are some folks who might be watching and thinking, okay, um, I, I sort of put your, I got put your name out there as, as someone who could be a person who gives some uh, advice and some consulting on how right. to be an entrepreneur. So my last question right. for you for tonight is, what is the main thing an entrepreneur should have when thinking about starting his or her, his or, or her own business? The main thing the main that I'm going to tell you that an entrepreneur needs to have is the skin. Okay, I need to repeat that again because it just, cut out. it just cut out. Say that again. A tough skin. Gotcha. Did you get that? Tough skin, yeah. You can't be, you can't be weak You because you're going to get a lot of no's. You're going to get a lot of disappointments. You're going to get people who you thought were going to support you. You're going to think, oh, I got this great idea. I know all these wonderful people. They're going to be there. They're going to rally around you. They're going to be help you. They're going to just be, oh, happy <laughs> for you. And that is not the case. So guess what? <laughs> Make my, my key note for everything is whatever you do and step out on, make sure you're doing it for your own edification and that you're passionate about it it's something that you believe in and that you really want to do because if nobody else comes if nobody else supports you still be happy that you're doing what you're doing and it's not necessarily for monetary gain these businesses that I have that pertain to children I I mean I'm going to tell you my New York City job did me well I mean Mm -hmm. I really don't have to work these are just things that I opt to do because I love children and it's fun I love right. to be, children keep you youthful. So when you they go do. from an atmosphere of being locked up in jail 16 and a half hours with, you know, men and women on, on a day-to-day basis for 20 years, it hardens you to a certain, mm. you know, degree. Right. So when you deal with children, it's the flip side. It kind of softens you up. And it also, you know, they need those type of people in their lives right. to start them early and to let, you know, because a lot of times I, I work so much, I wasn't home with my kids. And oh, I'm just yeah. very, very lucky and blessed that they were able to know that mommy worked really hard as a single parent, you know, okay. divorcee, worked really hard to maintain and ensure that they had a good lifestyle. And, you know, they never ended up in jail. Nothing, you know, I didn't have any grandkids while I was, in, you know, employed. They what? went to school, played sports, worked, drove. Never had any interactions with the police, mm. except that, you know, as time went on, those two incidents. But yeah. it, it, if we need mentors out here, we need people to see our children, talk to our children, and guide our children. And sometimes mommies and daddies are at work doing 16 right. hours, working two, working two jobs. The kids are going from school to after school to home. There, mm. There's really no interaction with the parents, not necessarily as much as the parent may want. So I yes. feel like if our if our community was able to have more businesses where we can work our own schedule, work our own shifts, it would be easier to kind of fill in the gaps and work around our children. Oh, I'm gonna be close today. Oh, I'm gonna. Um, my kid has a game today. You know, you can wow. you can do make your business flexible for your children. 
right. or become a part of a community that, hey, whoever you're working with, you may have some staff. Listen, on Wednesdays, I shut down because my son has football games or my daughter right. has dance. Right. So you don't want to be on anybody else's time when it comes to your kids if you can help it because that will just only strengthen your relationship with them and help them in the long run. Right. That is amazing advice. Um, so I want to remind everyone, the Shonda Carter, CEO and author, uh, your website has been up the whole show. So hopefully if anyone uh, is want to see what's there, go to www.simplycartercorp.com. Uh, Deshonda, you've been an amazing guest. Um, and just, re just remind everyone, uh, Deshonda does have a book out. Uh, it's on the website. Uh, and also, there are consulting services. I didn't even talk about the kids' services. I wish I would have. <laughs> but, um, but that's there, too. Well, they can find out on the website. Yes, they can. And by the way, my, my bachelor's degree is in child development, believe it or not. So I appreciate that statement because it is really important. Um, all right. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, again. Feel free to visit the thebattlewithmosespeople.com for other episodes of Moses People Speak. And again, Deshonda, thank you very much. And everyone, have a great night. Bye. Was it good? Was it good? <laughs>